when you're sitting you're focused on the breath. Even when you're well concentrated on the breath, you don't have just the breath. You've also got feelings, you've got the mind, and you've got mental qualities, all four frames of reference are right here. And the question as to which one you're going to pay attention to most depends on issues that come up. In the beginning you do want to focus on the breath and get used to being with the breath because the ways of working with the breath are going to be essential for dealing with problems that come up in terms of feelings in the mind. But don't expect that you'll master everything with regard to the breath before you have to think about feelings in the mind, because they can come in and intrude pretty quickly. Feelings are the big issue. You sit here and there's going to be pain in different, some part of the body. And how do you deal with that? The Buddha doesn't say explicitly, but it's implicit in the four steps dealing with feelings. In fact, if you look at them, you realize that the first two, breathing in and out, sensitive to rapture, breathing in and out, sensitive to pleasure, correspond to John Lee's elaborations on how to deal with pain. In other words, if there's pain in your knee, you don't focus on the knee. You try to focus on the parts of the body that can be made comfortable. His image is of eating a mango. If there's a rotten spot in the mango, you don't eat the rotten spot. You cut that out and eat just the rest. Let the worms have the rotten spot and don't go moving in with the worms. I found in particular if there's a pain on the right side of the body, you focus on the left. If there's a pain in front, you focus behind. I used to have migraines, and I found that focusing down on the base of the spine not only got me out of the migraine, but also had a good effect on the blood circulation. So this is an area where you can explore. Try to breathe in a way that feels really good, and it gives you something else to focus on beside the pain. The next two steps, being sensitive to metal fabrication and calming metal fabrication, those correspond to John Mahabhu's recommendations for how to deal with pain. Metal fabrication basically means feeling and perception, and the perception here is the important element. It's how you perceive the pain. You might want to ask yourself, what color is the pain, what shape is the pain? Strange questions, but the mind has some strange ideas about pain. After all, when did we first learn about pain? Before we knew language, we had already experienced it. And a lot of our pre-linguistic ways of reacting to pain and dealing with pain are still there, lurking under the surface. So to bring them up to the surface where you can see them and ask if they make any sense, you probe around with some questions. But we're trying to get at the perception. One thing you can do is bring in some new perceptions. One that I found really helpful is if there's a pain that seems to be fairly constant, try to notice it as discrete moments. And with each moment, it's going away, going away. It's like you're in the back of a train, shredding down the Heading down the track. You're not in the engine cabin. You're at the back of the caboose, watching things pass, go past, go past. And as they're going past, they're going away. So that you don't feel like you're being hit by the pain. The pain isn't coming at you. The pain is just appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing. Now hold that perception in mind and see what it does with regard to the pain. Or you can use some of a John Mahabhu's perceptions, particularly for the purpose of seeing that the pain and the body and your awareness are three different things. Can you see them as three different things? You start out with the perception and the reasons behind that. After all, the body is one thing. In other words, your sense of the body is the four elements, the qualities of earth, wind, water, and fire. In other words, solidity, energy 
coolness, warmth. That's your sense of the body. Now, when pain comes, it's something else. It's none of those things. It's in the same place, but it's not the same thing. Can you ferret it out and see that it is different? And then your awareness. Your awareness is different from these two things, because after all, the pain doesn't know anything. The body doesn't know anything. It's your awareness that knows. So it's a different quality. And we can reason ourselves to see things that way, but to actually see it, to see the distinction, that requires that you look very carefully and ask yourself, where do you not see the distinction? Where have you glommed things together? The mind has this tendency to glue all kinds of things together, make a big mass and a big mess of suffering. Can you use perceptions that cut through that, through that glue? Because the pain is on its own. It is something separate. It is something different. It's a different kind of phenomenon. But when we lay claim to the leg, say, or the knee as being ours, and then anything that moves into our territory is attacking us, you've got to start questioning that assumption. Okay, is it mine? Do I really want to lay claim to this? Am I really being invaded? And here, you, for the time being, you identify with the awareness. So you don't identify with the pain and don't identify with the body. And you see that it really is something different. Then you can be with the pain. It can be there. And you can be fully aware of it, but it doesn't seep in. It's that perception that creates the bridge. So even though the Buddha doesn't give specific instructions on how to deal with pain, all he basically says is there are pains you have to endure and there are the pains you can avoid. And the pains you avoid, are, th you know, in other words, come from would come from doing stupid things. Going out at night and falling into a cesspool, going out and tripping over a cow. That's one of the examples he gives. In other words, you don't go into dangerous places. You don't put yourself in a position where you have useless dangers. But there are two kinds of pains he said you have to deal with. There are pains of physical pains that are sharp, and then there are pains of hurtful words. Those are things you have to tolerate. You have to learn how to develop some resistance to them. So even though he doesn't give specific instructions on how to endure pain, they're there implicitly in his instructions on how to deal with feelings as they come up in the course of the meditation. The lesson here, of course, is that there's a lot more in the Dharma than it's just in the texts. You have to take some of the basic principles and work out their implications for yourself. It's good that we have the ajans. And this is one of the reasons why the texts are written as they are. They were not meant to be read except in the context, or not meant to be known except in the context of people who are actually practicing. Because the people who practice can give you all kinds of insights into how they might apply, as long as their teachings are in line with the text, they are useful. Added dimension. But even they can't tell you everything. John Mahabu comments on listening to a John Mun give a Dharma talk. And a John Mun would give these long Dharma talks. Sometimes they go on for four hours. But he said basically what a John Mun would be giving you would be the trunk of a tree, and you had to work out the branches. Not everything was explained. So it takes some of these ideas about the perceptions that help you endure pain, and ask yourself, what else can I Due to what kind of questions can I ask about my pains, so that the fabrication of the or the mental fabrication and that's in perception actually does get calm. In other words, you learn to think about the pain and perceive the pain in ways that allow its effect on the mind to grow calm. It's there, but it doesn't have to stir things up. And it's the perception that stirs things up, and the perceptions that can calm things up, depending on which perceptions you use. It's going to make all the difference. But realize that you do have that freedom 
to change your perceptions. The same principle applies to hurtful words. The Buddha gives two prime examples of how to think about hurtful words. One is that this is normal. He says they're hurtful words and they're kind words. They're true words and they're false words. This is the nature of human speech. So it's not that you're being subjected to anything out of the ordinary. And then he says you have to develop goodwill for the person speaking to you, for everybody, for yourself, everybody else. It has your whole perception in mind. He says, even if someone were to pin you down, you know, like bandits would pin you down and start sawing off your limbs with a two-handled sword, you shouldn't let your goodwill be affected by that. He says, if you keep that perception in mind, then when people say hurtful things, you should be able to stand them. You realize it's not nearly that bad. That's one perception. The other one is someone says something hurtful, and you just tell yourself, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear, and leave it at that. How many times have you left it at that? Usually we're all ready to embroider it and add even more knives to what they had to say. In other words, the thoughts say, why do they say that to me? Why are they being disrespectful to me? Why is this person so horrible? My feelings are being hurt. The whole gamut of perceptions that you can apply around that. You're not calming mental fabrication when you think that way. The calming perception is simply, okay, there's an unpleasant sound that made contact at the ear. They make contact and they stop. Our problem is that our minds reverberate like a gong. You hit the gong and it goes on for a long time. In the same way the contact was made and may have been made a long time ago, but it can still reverberate in your mind. You can still dig it up. Even though that, that person may have forgotten what, what he or she said. So just those four comments about how to breathe in a way that gives rise to rapture and pleasure, breathe in a way that makes you sensitive to mental fabrication, breathe in a way that calms mental fabrication. You can apply that to all kinds of pains, like the pains of hurtful words. If you're sitting here breathing in, the, in a way that feels really full and pleasant, you're not so hungry to feed off of the nice things that other people might say, so that when they end up saying harsh things, you're not sitting there with your mouth open trying to feed on what they have to say. So these four principles are useful in all kinds of circumstances for dealing with pains at all kinds of levels. So learn how to take these basic principles and work out the branches. In other words, how they apply to specific issues as they come up. Then you find that in exercising your discernment in this way, exercising your ingenuity in this way, the Dharma becomes yours. It's not something imposed from some outside authority or from some strange culture someplace else. It becomes the principles by which you manage your own mind, manage your own life in a way that gives rise to a happiness that's really solid. That kind of appropriation of the Dharma is perfectly fine. <laughs>